Good evening. I'm Jonathan Mandel. I was uh, asked to moderate this because I wrote an article for uh, American Theater Magazine on cool downs. And I, I was at an award ceremony and I asked the winners how they cooled down. Austin McKenzie said, the professor an professional answer would be to do a warm down and that kind of stuff, but I, what I really like to do is have a drink. <laughs> Philip Boykin said, a vodka with cranberry always helps. Some said they played video games. Some said they tell jokes. Some said they tell, take a shower. To me, the most instructive answer was from Ben Wishaw, a graduate of the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, who seems to uh, make a habit of being only in intense roles. Yeah. At the time, he was a proctor um, in the Crucible on Broadway. And he said, sadly, they don't teach you such things at drama school. I wish they did. It's one of those things I'm still learning. I haven't quite mastered it yet. So tonight, three of the panelists will be leading us through some cool down exercises that actors probably should have been taught along with the warm up exercises and, uh, and getting into character techniques uh, in formal trainings. So, but before that, I'm kind of curious. I have several questions I'd like our panel to explore which came up for me as I was writing this article. And first, let's, uh, I'd like to examine the assumption behind the very title of this panel, that intense performances need recovery and release. And the first person I'd like to ask is right to my left, who's Thalia Goldstein is the Assistant Professor of Applied Developmental Psychology in George Mason University. She's a former musical theater a performer, a dancer, an actor. And she now has a column in Psychology Today, whose name I keep on forgetting that I wrote, The Mind, the mind on Stage. So when I was uh, doing this article, she said to me that this notion that actors, that, it, it, that acting is a dangerous profession, that actors take risks to their health, goes back to Cicero and the Romans. The fact that you can even say that is, uh, exciting. So I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about what's the history of uh, attitudes towards acting as dangerous. And more importantly, are there actually any real studies, medical studies, psychological studies, demographic studies, any kind of studies that nail down that uh, what one, a skeptic, if I were skeptical, I'd say is a romantic, might be a romantic notion about acting being unhealthy and needing to be recovered from. So what kind of studies are there? Um, well, that's a multi-layered question, but <laughs> yeah. a, a very good one. Um, I will say that uh, some of the history of um, the idea that acting is dangerous comes from uh, audiences perhaps not believing that you can simply pretend to experience deep and extreme emotion. Usually the type of emotions that audiences see on stage um, when they are seen in daily life, right? When you have a sibling or a partner or a friend who shows you the type of overt expression that uh, we see in film or television or on stage, it means that something's gone terribly wrong. And so if you go back to what our autonomic reactions are to watching somebody else in that state, the, the initial response is um, what's called emotion contagion, right? To experience the same thing that, what, that, uh, that you're watching somebody else experience. The trick, of course, is with actors and acting that there is also this level of fiction possibly put on top of it. And that depends on sort of what theory you come to being an audience member from. So if you come as an audience member thinking that actors are really experiencing what they are showing you, then you're going to think that acting's pretty dangerous because it looks like when your friends and relatives have been having real problems. But if you come with a theory that it's all just fiction and it's all just pretend and it's all just made up, then you're not going to think it's dangerous. You're saying for the audience or you're saying the performers themselves? I think it actually works both ways, you know, and I, I do think that um, there aren't 
an, there, there is not a psychology of acting from a systematic scientific perspective. We really don't know. We have anecdotes. There are a few studies that show some effects of acting. But for the most part, research on acting has looked more at the positive effects of acting, um, positive effects on understanding other people, empathy, the ability to recognize emotions. So the idea of acting as dangerous versus acting as helpful is, uh, from a scientific perspective, still a question. Did you want to this is um, Aaron Mee is the assistant arts professor and undergraduate drama at the Tisch School of the Arts at NYU. Um, I'd also like to add to this conversation from the perspective of ritual. So I actually think this dates well before Cicero. Um, there is often an analogy made, or whether this is accurate or not, we could debate uh, all night in another forum, but um, uh, when a shaman in a ritual is possessed by a deity or is thought to be possessed by the deity, the two moments in the ritual that get the most attention are the moments where the shaman becomes possessed and the moments where the shaman becomes, for lack of a better term, depossessed, right? Uh, <laughs> and when you, tr when you take this uh, notion out of its ritual context and apply it to the theatrical context, uh, this becomes, the analogy becomes the actor becoming the character and the actor getting out of character again. And in many, many uh, methods of actor training, there is great attention paid to becoming the character and very little attention paid to getting out of character, right? In ritual, there is equal attention paid to both those moments. Somehow when we, and, and the reason is because it's dangerous, which is to say that if the shaman do, is not possessed, then no ritual occurs. But if the shaman isn't, again, for lack of a better term, depossessed, then um, there are stories that are told in numerous rituals in numerous countries about the shaman going crazy or the shaman killing people or the shaman, right, et cetera, et cetera. So this notion that um, there are people, and you were talking earlier back in the green room about uh, working on shows with, um, uh, Alexander coaches and et cetera. And, we, right? We're going to get to that, I promise. No, 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 I know. Wait, I want to get to the But what I want to say is in a please, ritual. Please, please, please. I want to okay. talk first, <laughs> firsthand uh, with uh, Carl Hendrick Louis, who's um, an actor uh, who was on Broadway in the Cherry Orchard, but that's not the reason why we invited him here. He was also currently an actor in 1984, a show I saw and that I read that a lot of people are throwing up and fainting. And so the question I have is, are, what, that's the audience we're talking about. Yes. What about the actors? How are they reacting? We are generally happy and ecstatic after the show. Obviously, we might be a little fatigued and tired if it's a, obviously like a two-show day. But um, at least for me, um, if you guys know about the show, you know, it's a very intense, dark play. And... Um, for me, I feel completely fine. Um, after the show is over, I go home, I spend time with my wife, I have a good night's sleep, hang out with my son in the morning, I get to the theater, I do a pretty lengthy warm up to prepare myself about like, if I, if I don't have a crazy day, I have at least like 45 minutes to prepare myself before I go on stage, and then we do a company warm up together, and then we have a half hour to change, and then we, we do it. So in terms of, so for what this discussion is about possibly being dangerous or my post effect thus far, at least for myself, I feel fine. <laughs> I feel great. I feel healthy. Um, um, so it, that's my two cents. I had heard that there actually were a number of injuries. Yes, uh, I mean, I am included in that. Um, I could just say, but obviously it's a Broadway show, so there's tons of moving parts. Um, there is a part in the show where the, the stage like completely breaks down and um, 
one of the actors missed uh, her cue to move, which was a domino effect, and I got smashed by a wall. Um, and so I had to get physical therapy for a few weeks, but I was okay. Um, other injuries, I mean, it's a very physical show, it is very specific, and if you miss your timing, something can happen to someone, which, you know, which, which, which is unfortunate. Well, you, you're making it, uh, physical, you're talking about physical things. And what oh, I'm worried, it, is, um, there's a, for those of you who saw the show, there's a half hour torture scene, mm -hmm. which is right. very hard for the audience to take. So I'm very curious about the actors in it. Are you, it, is it something that it's just different for the audience outside than it is for the actors? Are, you know, is it a tough scene for you to do for a half an hour like that with the loud music, the blood and all that? For, for me, not at all. Um, <laughs> and I will say because, well, okay, one of the reasons why I love this play, particularly at this time, um, I feel for, I, I personally feel for an older generation of people who come see the play, it's very difficult for them. However, I feel like for a younger audience who are used to, in my opinion, who watch, who play video, like, you know, I grew up playing a ton of video games, watching violent films, and so for me, I guess you could say the word I'm slightly desensitized, if you want to use that word. So for me, I am totally okay with it. However, as an actor, you know, I set up to do a play, and I read the play, and I read what the director wanted to do, and I was completely game. I completely understood what they were trying to achieve, and I personally don't have any emotional um, discomfort or distress or about doing a play. However, I will say there were, um, there is an actor in the show who had issues getting there for, for himself. And I completely understood and we we're all very supportive and the directors were to help him understand what was needed to do the play and for him to get through his personal process to um, achieve what his character needed to do for the show. Um, so I, I really can't speak for his personal mental being and process for that, but he had tough times, but he understood what. So you're saying he had tough time getting into the, sh into the scene. Did he have a tough time getting out of it, or does anybody else had a tough time getting out of that particular scene? Um, getting out of it. I don't know if that's lingo. I just mean, you know, <laughs> when it's over. I, like, I could people relax and go on with their lives, or does it take, does it, take something out of them. Um, I mean, it always does, but you know, to each person is different. And I feel also, you know, I personally want to speak of other people's experience when they're not here. Um, I think it's, it's their right, and I can say something that's not totally true for their experience. So I, you know, I can only say there are people who had, who had issues with, you know, getting through things, but they figured out for the sake of, you know, doing their part. In terms of how they felt afterwards, like I, you know, I, you'd have to ask them. So I want to talk to the other actor on the panel, Jessica Pimentel is in um, Orange is the New Black, which has scenes of uh, violence. And, uh, and <laughs> <laughs> so I was wondering, so to ask you the same question, or, and also, I guess this brings up another issue, is there a difference between such scenes on screen, when you're doing it for the screen versus on stage? Yeah, it's, um, I guess you would say cooking in a microwave and cooking on a stove and cooking in an oven. You're cooking at the end of it, but they require different amounts of time. You know, some is a, a quick process, some is a very lengthy process. Some has to be sustained for many hours if you're shooting, for example, a film uh, or television show, or let's say you have to get slapped. Well, in a play, we've rehearsed that slap, we've gone through the slap, and what does the slap mean, and why am I getting slapped, and when's the last time I got slapped, and how did I feel? <laughs> and we went through all that. And you'll do that as well in a TV or in a film, but when you do it on... on film or television, um, you'll have to go through that slap over and 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 over <laughs> and then turn around and do it over and over and over. <laughs> so it's, uh, at, at least when you're on stage, it's ki it can be just in the moment. Being on stage is kind of like uh, getting in a roller coaster. You, you've seen the trail, you know what's gonna happen at the end, you're watching it all happen, you prepare yourself, Mentally, physically, you get in and you hold on tight and whatever happens, happens, and hopefully you don't fall out and you don't die. Uh, whereas in uh, 
the TV process or the filming process, you have to be able to kind of start going up that ramp and then, you know, come back down. And then you get to that peak. Oh, we're going to fall. Oh, wait, hold on. Let's move this. Okay, now go ahead. So that takes an another level of preparation and concentration that is different than, than theater, for example. You wanna, are they qualifiably different in terms of one's better than the other or they're just different? They're just, they're, they're, there's no better than the other. It's whatever it, whatever it takes, basically, to get you. I feel like at least when you're in a play, you have this kind of momentum that's just like you're getting shot out of a, a sling, a catapult, and you can just... Once you have your preparation down, because you've been rehearsing for weeks, so you know what's you know that character inside and out, of course, and that circumstance, you know what's going to happen. So once you get shut out, you just go, and hopefully, you can you've let your your personal life behind. You've let it at the door of the theater, and you can just be in that moment and go moment to moment with your fellow actors and cast, crew, and moving parts. Actually, you just brought up an interesting issue, always interesting me, the difference between coming back down, assuming you have to, from a specific performance and coming back down from a role. Yeah. And your role is what? How many seasons is it now? We're working on the sixth right now. So I'm a little so bruised you have like up. A, so during the summer, do you, do you continue to be one of the, you know, in prison? Or, you know, how do you come down from the I, character? I mean, coming down from a role in theater where you've played this over and over, this record over and over, you know, you're saying goodbye to an old friend in a certain kind of way. And you've grown accustomed to the, um, the routine of doing it, of part of it, the actor routine of getting to the theater, doing your warm-up, getting dressed, putting on the makeup, getting on the stage, doing the role and leaving. And then there's the character that's now your best friend. You know the words, without even knowing the words, they just come out of your face, you know. Uh, whereas when you're doing the television show, every week we have no idea what we're doing. So the character is, is a different kind, a different embodiment of your work. So you have to know this character and always know what would Maria do, for example. And even, even the actor might say, well, Maria wouldn't do that, and you open the book, but she is going to be doing that <laughs> today. And you have to learn how to justify on the spot. So that's kind of the difference. When, you know, the 13 episodes or whatever are over with, do you feel the need to decompress or there's no problem with Usually that? Usually by the end of the 13th, you're very happy that it's over. You've probably been through hell. You've probably been wet for a month or two, speaking for myself only. Uh, somehow we always end up in water. I don't know. <laughs> kind of the symbol, symbolic purification. Uh, and then you just, I don't, I don't, just don't watch it, don't think about it, don't, it's, it's usually well written enough that we're very happy that it's, that it's over when it's over. But we look, but it's enough to look forward to see what's happening next. It's always exciting. So um, I'd like to get Elizabeth Reese into the conversation, who's a, a teacher of the Alexander Technique and is also a, a licensed mental health counselor. And I'm going to put you on the spot because we have here two obviously healthy actors on the panel. So I want to ask Outwardly you whether you appearing, have so any yes. uh, patients who are unhealthy. And, uh, and part of the issue they deal with is this issue of getting into character and getting out of character. That's a big question. Uh, so, you know, in terms of particular, in particular patients, um, it, because it's complicated with each client um, in terms of how their unhealthiness or finding better healthiness is the way I would really phrase it more, um, is, is learning some sort of resiliency. Resiliency is a big buzzword in, in the therapy world. Um, so how can they use these skills to negotiate their lives better, to find a better balance, uh, which is why I love the connection with the Alexander Technique, um, using breathing techniques, using mindfulness, mindfulness techniques, um, so I, I think that idea of the unhealthy actor, it's like, uh, it was saying this up in the green room, it's like we can be unhealthy in any profession. Um, and uh, you could be an unhealthy, as I said, you can be unhealthy leader. Yes. <laughs> Who's going to say that, you know? Or we can be unhealthy lawyers or unhealthy teachers, right? So there's, the, that the issue of mental health is a little bit different than, what are the particular things that an actor deals with? I'd like to go 
back to the issue that I started with, with the actors I talked to, you know, drinking as a way to, as their technique for, well, yeah, I can ask Aaron me, um, who's the first person who clued me into this neglect on the part of, um, in active training. So can you talk a little bit about, are there some schools or schools of technique that are better at getting people out of, you, you know, to relax after all than others or none of them are any good or, <laughs> and, why, and why is this not part of, you know, automatically part of uh, actor training? Right, and I'd like to tie this back too to your conversation about a 45 minute warm up and a, right? I didn't hear you say anything about, and at the end of the show, we get together for a 45 minute <laughs> yoga no, session. No, you don't want anyone to touch you after no, the I show. No, I know, I know. But, go away. <laughs> but in other words, I, I think oh, okay. that um, <clears throat> we spend a lot of energy <laughs> and time training people to get into character, and very little time if any, and we'll, we'll break this down a little bit, but um, <clears throat> giving people exercises to release the character, right? Absolutely. To go home. Um, I first noticed this at the Guthrie when everyone went out to drink and smoke, right? Um, and I'm not against drinking. I'm, I am against smoking, but... Um, <laughs> um, but as long as that's a choice and not sort of the only way. Um, and I think that uh, there are many methods of actor training where you learn, you do a warm up, you uh, do physical exercises, you do often a yoga warm up, a meditation, et cetera, to come to a neutral, to get into the character, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> there are some things that Grotowski did to get out of character, although uh, his actors were notoriously. Um, unhealthy and died very young. Uh, no, I mean, you know, in all seriousness. Um, uh, Stella Adler training has a little bit of stuff to get out of the character. There are often uh, things that, you know, again, uh, lying down on the floor, breathing, et cetera, that many people do. Um, I think often it's individual teachers and I think it's certainly individual methods of actor training. Um, I think we also know that um, there's a feedback loop between physicality and em emotion, right? This is why I always tell um, my teenage daughter not to slouch. Slouching <laughs> is a physical embodiment. <laughs> but I mean, Slouching can be a result of feeling unhappy, depressed, or sad, or it can cause it, yep. right? So there's this feedback loop. So, uh, and Lecoq training will teach you to sort of embody the character physically, and that will give rise to the emotion, right? Um, and the reverse can happen on the way out. So some actor training methods do pay attention to cool down, warm down, release of the character, and some don't. Um, and I, but I'm, I'm again struck by your description of 1984 of how much time goes into preparing. And then it may be that you do a cool down, but we didn't hear about it. That wasn't the first thing She's that tripped off really the tongue. I know, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so in terms of this evening, is there a very specific cool down that at least that I do or the production of your other project I've been in? The answer to that is no. However, um, is there a specific warm up that you all do together? For this particular production, yes, we do. Yeah. Um, so that, in a certain sense, supports my uh, theory that, you know, I, I think as an industry, we need to do a better job of investing in the actor's health. I do, I can't help but feel that there's a sort of capitalist notion that. We're happy to prepare you for the role because then you go on and we've sold the tickets. But once people have bought the tickets and seen the show, we don't really care what happens. And I'm not talking about we in this room because obviously we do care we're here. But I, I do feel as an industry, as a society, that some more attention should be paid to the health of the actor. That's just my little manifesto. So No, no, I mean, I, I, I completely hear what you're saying, and so it makes you think about 
you know, depending, and, and, and again, I feel like this is extremely case by case because I guess how the world is at, at, at this moment, but I guess in I do what you're speaking of is that, you know, there'd be a time either at the end of the production or maybe every night that the entire cast would get together and do some form of cool down, but also kind of feel to me right now, as I'm hearing it, I'm still digesting it. It seems to me um, the actor needs to be more self-aware of what he or she needs um, to cool down. Because, you know, like, you know, for example, like, you know, um, this part for me at this moment, um, yeah, it's, it's eight shows a week and it's, and it's demanding, but I also knew what I was going into. And also for me, I took very specific steps to prepare my body to do this. And so when this show is over, um, I right now, I don't think that I will need a cool down. May I might, I don't know. Well, let me ask a question of the two of you, and I also want to ask the audience, though I can't see but you. I'm trying to... Um, <laughs> Sorry. What, has, has there ever been a production in which there was a built-in cool-down period as well as a built-in warm-up period that you've been in? Since I've been out of school, uh, 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 built-in... I mean, my like feeling is play, if it's not in play, 1984, where is it going to be? Meaning, meaning that as the play goes on, it's kind of in, in the play? that your characters, I mean, if there's a resolution within the play, then you can go on. I mean, we like to say, do it live and leave it on the floor. Right. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've had that time to warm up. You've built up that energy. You have that momentum. Your body feels ready. Your mind feels ready. Your emotions are ready. You take it to the fullest and you don't leave anything and you leave it on the floor so that when you walk off the stage, it's there. It's, you're, you're not talking, carrying it with you. You're, you're talking about you as an individual, and we're gonna, t right. we're gonna address that in a second here. But I'm talking about, and I'm not judging, I'm asking right. yeah. whether there are productions that you've been involved in, either screen or stage, in which as a group, you've had a cool down period at the end of the episode, the show, or whatever. Well, does a, so there's a cool down, does the definition of cool down is the same as like a warm up or do you know what I'm saying? However, yeah, you, on stage I, or off stage. Something that you did together <laughs> to leave, as you put it, to leave it on the floor and, and go away. I, I, I would say together individually, because I would agree with you. Together, yeah. It depends on the role, it depends on the circumstances, it depends on the person, it depends right. on the right. I mean, if you're playing Medea, right, and then you, you might need a minute before you, to, right? before you, right. before you, know, you talk to anybody. To bed, yeah. That might be one thing. If you're in 1984 and there's this half hour torture scene, there might be, you know, I, I mean, I think it depends on the person and the, but it depends but, on the so person, the role, but I've never had an experience that we yeah. had a ritual. Ever happened. Yeah. But let me ask the audience. Has I have two ritual questions. Rector ever Can I ask two that? questions no. of the audience? There could be a hug or something after. Yeah. I think it's interesting that a director. Raise your hand if, you had, in, as part of your formal training, you had not just warm-ups, but you also had cool-downs or instructions on how to cool down. So out of the 100 people, I see six. And uh, now put your hands down. And raise your hand if you've been involved in a production, let's say a stage production, I'll ask that first, in which you have a group a cool down period at the end of either at the end of an individual show or at the end of the run. Not including alcohol. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Those same six, they must be instructing. The rest oh, no. okay. <laughs> I have an idea. Yeah. Um, so, what's really interesting about this idea of pre preparation and of spending this 45 minute warm up and having a group warm up, but also of the preparation before you went in rehearsal or before you arrive on set, is that it sets up the idea of a psychological quarantine. Mm -hmm. So, psychological quarantine is something we talk about when we talk about children's pretend play. It's a philosophical term that basically means you're setting up for yourself a separate world in which certain rules apply, you know certain emotions can be experienced, and then the door gets shut to that world as soon as it's over. And this is something that humans do, right? Humans can immerse themselves in a book and then shut the book. They can turn on a television program and then turn it off. They can be involved in pretend play and role play and acting and leave it all out there on the floor and then walk away from it. Um, this is the way in which we're all able to play different roles in our daily life, right? 
right? You are one person at work and one person at home and one person in the rehearsal studio because we have this natural intrinsic ability to quarantine the sort of various pieces of our world. And so this idea of warming yourself up is really building the world for yourself, right? Building this separate space for yourself that you then inhabit for a while and then shut the door on. So I think it's an interesting idea of whether the shutting of that door is something that as professional actors, you can do as easily as say a five-year-old might say, okay, teddy bear time is over, now we're gonna go play with Legos. Um, or, or whether, because that's the sort of basic psychological functioning that we're all imbued with, or whether as adults, as professional actors, depending on the individual, the role, the day, you need something formal in order to shut that door. I guess the question though, I that's an interesting word. What is it, quarantine? Quarantine. What? quarantine Cog yeah. It's cognitive quarantine. Cognitive quarantine. I guess the question is, um, uh, when emotional contagion happens, right? Um, once one has created that contagion, it's a little bit harder to quarantine. And I guess the question too, and, and so maybe this is a more general question. I'm, turning back to you for advice or, um, but that, uh, you know, people do have trouble leaving work at work and coming home. People do have trouble switching roles and those are social roles, but you know, maybe we want to talk an about analogies between social roles and theater roles or something. But, um, but I mean, you know, when people have had a really bad day at the office, often they bring that attitude home and you can see, right? And that's why it's called cognitive quarantine, not emotional quarantine. Right. Because but, there's two different pieces of it. Yeah, but I guess the question is, again, if in our training we have spent so much time teaching people how to do half the job, shouldn't we have invested in the other half? I think that's also something that will evolve as an actor continues their mm -hmm. process. Uh, because I can't say that every warm up for every role is the same. And I sometimes right. if it's right. something with a dialect, it'll begin purely with vowels and sounds. And if it's a, a very physical role, it might be a yoga warm up and all that and nice kind of breathing techniques and, and so on and so forth. And some of it is just, you know, playing some heavy metal music as loud as I yeah, can right. and putting on my costume. And then yeah. as I put on and the costume, the then you become that person. And then when you're done, as you take those pieces off, that person goes away. Which is a nice segue to what I promised. Some of you want to show some very practical, specific techniques for the performers in the audience to... Uh, I don't know, you tell me what, to cool down or whatever you want to call it. So who wants to start with that? I would be happy to start with that. Right. Um, but I want to uh, just, what I noticed is the different ways that you would talk about something. There's a difference between performance and rehearsal. And when you were talking about rehearsal process, like the, the fellow actor that was struggling with the role, or when you're finding something, that I wonder if that's when something like a cool down or when you're training to be an actor, that's when you're really processing these skills that, as you say, are that's, lifelong. That's sometimes when you be able to do sometime. the, yeah. the, the right. what did you call it? The, quarantine. The, the, right. the quarantine. It's like that's a skill that we develop, that we learn, we can learn to leave work at home. We can learn to do these things. And I think that's so much, that's an important part of our training. Which is a good thing. And you'll learn what works for you and what doesn't work may for you I, in that rehearsal. Yeah, piggyback it sounds like that. you have. Wait, here, go ahead. What were you going to say? Is it okay to piggyback on what you just said? What, what? Is it okay for me to piggyback on what you yeah, just said? Um, in terms of like training, so I'll use myself as an example. Or you know, when you are trained to be an artist, as my in my case, an actor, you're in a you're in a school for three years or four. In my case, was three, and you're constantly in a room pushing yourself. Um, you know, like trying to break your, your barriers, your fears. And when you do that 24-7, that can be very scary. And you, know, you, could, you could even use the word possibly dangerous. Mm -hmm. At least at the institution that I went to, um, they offered, um, you know, we had all types of people there to, to support us from, from an Alexander teacher to a yoga teacher to a voice teacher, like, you know, the, the main principles. Mm -hmm. But then we also had uh, a therapy department. And, you know, the, one of the first things that we did in orientation, they said, hey, we have this floor, I think it's the eighth floor. 
You can come to us anytime. We're available for you because we understand that you guys are here 24-7, um, constantly working on yourself, which is a very difficult thing to do, and it could be, you know, taxing. And I ended up going to that place for the last for the last two years, you know, at least once a week, and it was very instrumental. And I feel like at least in that place is because I was in a place for three years constantly looking at myself and, you know, oh, my gosh, what am I doing? This is not good. Or, and, you know, you need someone to help you to be, to be clear. So when you get to the professional world, you know, and the regular job, I can just go into a room and do what's asked of me and, you know, and be okay with it and feel healthy, which I have been. Um, so Did you tell us where you went to school? I went to NYU for uh, grad school. And then for undergrad, I went to Fordham University. So we want to do this or not? Yes, yes, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, is this on? May, may I give you guys something just before you start? Um, in my experience, you know, people go over the edge. Oh, sorry. <laughs> in my experience of watching people go over the edge, um, when I was in the High School of Performing Arts, we were doing a war play, and one young man could not stop attacking as a soldier. Mm -hmm. And they had to call for an ambulance and take him away. And he never came back to the school. Also, I had read about... Wait, wait, hold on. No, I have three Right things. now, we're supposed to be doing okay. exercises. In order to do, have that time, okay. We really need to be this in sections. The first section was this conversation we had. The next section is showing these techniques, which I presume people in the audience want to see. Yeah. Then the third section will be questions from the audience. OK, so hold off. We have time. So uh, I'm going to take you through. This is, uh, yikes, I'm slipping on here. This is uh, a, a way that I often introduce the Alexander technique, but I'm going to do a couple of disclaimers first. One is I, I'm going to ask you to do something. Don't overact. You are all actors. So don't overact and tell me afterwards, oh my God, when I did that exercise, I pulled my neck out. Right, so that's number one. The other is, is that, uh, you know, truly act. So this isn't like musical theater acting, right? You know, so I really want you to do this. It's a self-observation, you'll see what I mean. <laughs> Not against musical theater. I'm married to a musical theater actor, so I can make that joke. <laughs> um, okay, so, so this is the real part, and I'll, I'll do it with you, so. I was gonna say, I always say that. I'll do it with you so you don't feel strange, because I do this with non-actors, too, but you're not gonna feel strange, you're actors, right? Um, so what we're gonna do is, uh, is cringe right? Startle, like a startle response. And, um, and so just on the count of three, we're just going to go one, two, three, and startle. And then I want you to hold that position, okay? And this is where I say I don't want you to overact and pull your neck out or something. So we can do it up here too, if you want to join in. So uh, one, two, three, let's all group cringe. Now as you're cringing, I want you to notice uh, the shoulders and the relationship to the ears. Notice your feet and their relationship to the ground. Notice, I'm going to talk fast so I don't leave you there. Notice your thighs, your upper leg, and the relationship to the pelvis. Notice your rib cage and your, and your lack of breathing, possibly, your shallow breathing. And notice the back of your neck. And then come on out of it. Now, the really good news is that I didn't have to teach anybody here how to come out of it. But I will tell you how you did come out of it, is that if we did it in slow motion, you freed your neck from any downward compression and you let your shoulders move away and your limbs moved away and you took a deep breath. So you came out of this startle, startle response. Um, so there's a reason for this. So all animals do it. it. I've done a lot of research with horses. I work, you know, they go, ah, a piece of paper. They, you know, they do the same thing. Oh, it's like fair. So they're fight or flight. They're really interesting animals to study fight or flight because their prey as opposed to predators. Um, and so their flight response is very strong. Um, and so why? You know, why the back of the neck? Well, we're protecting, we bring the shoulders in to protect the heart, and we bring the legs in to protect the gut, and we rotate the head back and down to protect the brainstem, right? So it's like the lions don't get me here in the back. It's like, ah, right? So we're going to do this again. And this time, I want you just to just barely, barely pull down, right? So you're just going to uh, just almost think about pulling down very gently. So one, two, three, everybody just pull again. 
and feel, again, that overall pattern, right? The neck is tight. The shoulders are there. It's very little. And then come on out of it. And again, notice that there's almost a collective breath in the room, right? So now we're just going to think a couple. I'm going to say a couple of words. And, I'm, and, and again, you're just going to hear the words. And notice if it elicits any sort of startle or flight response. Mexico. Healthcare. President. <laughs> North Korea. Right? So both laughs and feel now the residual of that. Does everyone feel a little pulled down and in? <laughs> right? And feel again that overall pattern and maybe turn the volume up of it just a little tiny bit so you can feel that sort of spring-like action in the body and then come on out of it. So this is something that you can do anytime. You can do this like I'm doing tree pose in yoga class. You know, eh, right? Uh, I, uh, you know, I'm on the subway and it's really crowded. You know, how do I start pulling down and in? And then just to notice that pattern, come on out of it. And then you can build on that to go, wow, you know, I do that. Maybe I have this overall pattern as I do that some little residual stays. You know, I maybe came out of it, but that left shoulder, that's still in the fight or flight. You know, that's still pulling down and in. So we have this fight, flight, or freeze, right, is the last part of that. And so the pattern of freeze or dissociation, or sometimes called the defeat response, I think they're all basically the same words for that. I have to connect with the psychologist, more expertise than me. Um, and that's kind of the same pattern. That's sort of when the whole body kind of collapses. But the pattern is about the same. Because remember, it starts with this and then gives up. You know, this is our, our, our whole psychophysical part. And if we can wake that psychophysical part up to kind of go, where, where is this related to touching a hot stove? Where is this related to, I got to get out of Dodge now? You know, it's like, where is this? And then again, when I see the pattern, the physical pattern, the feel the pattern, sort of feel the emotion of the pattern, and then I can very easily find my way out. When we know what it is we're doing, it's much easier to find a way out. I don't know, we didn't talk about this before, but you have some techniques. Is there anything you can show? Jessica. Oh, hi. Uh, well, I mean, well, we, there are many, you know, physical ones and... and uh, uh, which are great to get your body out of it. Uh, music is huge for me. It's the first thing I do. The second I get into the dressing room is I put whatever opposite feeling was happening in the room is the music I find. So if we were doing something really down and serious and heavy, you know, you just put some pop music, jump around, get that on. Or if it was something that was like really, really fun, it might put something kind of mellow, some Enya or, you know, like take it easy. Don't take yourself so seriously. And sometimes that's what we do. We're actors. We're actors. We take things so seriously. <laughs> but really, like, we are masters of pretend and make-believe. But what you can do is take this pretend and this make-believe thing that can be so self-indulgent and self-serving and make it something that serves humanity. And it serves yourself. It serves the world around you. It serves you, the, the world close to you and far away from you energetically and that is using your breath. And the, the, the process that I use is a Tibetan meditation called Tonglen, and it's the meditation of taking and giving, it's called. And uh, this was brought to Tibet from India. It was a very popular practice, and then somewhere in Tibet it became more of a secret thing because it asks us to do kind of the very opposite thing that we've all been taught to do. It's, we all know, take in the good and let out the bad, right? But what you're doing is releasing more bad into the world and taking more good for yourself. And that's the, the opposite of what um, Buddhist tradition, Buddhist philosophy is. For us, everything is trying to absorb that, negative, that negativity, that suffering of humanity and convert it and change it into something positive and something good. So I guess I, I'll just talk you through it. I don't think we need to actually do it. Uh, and I'll try to explain it very, very, very simple. This is the most basic way that I can describe it. It's non-denominational. You can do this all day long. You can do it with each breath you take. And now you're going to take something that you do without even thinking and consciously turn it, turn it into something active and positive. 
So what you do is, uh, let's say you've had that rough day and you're very, very stressed out and someone has made you very, very angry. So let's take that, just blanket anger. You'll go into your room or whatever, whatever place you are, if you're on the bus or the train or in a cab in traffic like some of us were today. And you see yourself in a spacious area, whether that be for you a, a clear sky or you envision, envision the ocean. So for some people, it's black space. For me, I like that control room in the matrix. It's all, all white. It can be anything you want. And you just kind of relax yourself in there, get yourself in that moment and shut everything out as to the best of your abilities. There, we live in New York. It's very difficult. And then you try to uh, begin slowly focusing on the breath, cooling yourself down, calming yourself down, knowing that you're doing something with purpose. And start to envision texture, the texture of suffering. So for some people, it may be hot. For some people, it may be dark. For some people, it may be gritty. For some people, it may be loud or fast or slow. Whatever that means to you, you start thinking about that. And I personally use smoke as my uh, easiest one, but whatever comes to your mind, you start thinking about that texture of suffering and you bring it into your body. And you sit with that feeling. So you get to know that feeling, what that feeling feels like if we're using anger per se. And as you sit with that feeling, you know, well, I don't like this feeling probably. Probably no one else does. And it starts to change and slowly begins to dissipate and convert into the antidote of that feeling. So if you're feeling that anger as heat and darkness, then you can let it out of your body if it's through a breath. Some people envision coming out of their pores. If it's hot darkness, you can envision cool white light coming out of you. So you do that several times till you feel very confident that you know that quality of whatever suffering you're working with and you know the quality of the antidote. And with your breath out, releases the antidote. Now we take that and apply it to an actual situation. So let's say someone actually made me angry. And you see yourself with that quality of anger inside of you and you take it out, convert it, destroy it, and give yourself that antidote. And then you can do this for the, for the emotion itself or if it's for sickness, if you know someone's sick, you can visualize their sickness, take it away from them, convert it, and give them health. And with your out breath, with your out pouring, with your antidote giving, you can use a word love, or peace, or money, friendship, whatever the antidote is, or just envision that antidote going to them and know that as you send it, it is working. It is absolutely, positively working. And the more you do this, the more you will develop awareness of people around you. You'll develop compassion towards others. You'll be in the moment, every moment, which works for us actors, moment to moment. And you'll be very easily able to tap into any emotion that you may need. Because it doesn't have to be about your own personal experience anymore. If you have to do, for example, portray someone that's been sick with cancer and you've never had cancer. And, and maybe you don't know someone with cancer, but you, you can imagine, right? And you use that suffering of others you learn from that and you give them, the sentient beings, all beings in the world, exactly what they need, to, that medicine that they need. So now not only have you helped yourself, you've taken that selfishness out of your work, you've given your work purpose, you've given yourself an ease of life, but you've also helped another person, you've helped another being, and you've sent out a different energy into the planet. Now that's Tong Len in a nutshell. I hope you can use it. I'd like to record that and, and have it in my ear, but what, what do you, 
So do you say that to yourself aloud or do you say in your mind? I've been doing it for a long time. I really don't need to. I, it's something that I do even just walking down the street. If I see someone suffering, you see someone homeless, you see someone panhandling, you see someone fall down, you see someone sick, you see a, a, like a hurting little pigeon. You know, you can do it all day. It's an in-breath and an out-breath. It's not complicated. And then it becomes part of your everyday routine. You can say things, whatever, you have to know your mind. So for you, if you see, you, like, let's say you're feeling very lonely, you know? Let's say you're feeling very lonely. You feel like no one understands you. You're depressed. You're lonely. You're sad. You think about your loneliness, but also then you think, well, other people are going through this. I'm not alone. And then you'll start, whether these people are real or imaginary, you'll start feeling that loneliness. But guess what? When a room full of lonely people get together, there's not so much loneliness, right? And then yours is like not so bad, right? <laughs> it's never as bad as we think it is till we start looking outside of yourself. So then you, then you just learn that quality, what it feels like. You get to know it intimately. So when you have to use it for work, for example, uh, you can tap into it. But also when you see it out there, that person who's, you know, kind of brushing up against you behind the line, that anxiousness, whatever that feeling is, it doesn't affect you the same way. I absolutely do because uh, um, there are going to be situations that I can't relate to in any possible way that my character has to go through. Or there will be situations where I have to cry for 16 hours and at some point, hour number seven, we have to break for lunch and come back. So that's something that really helps when you need to s sustain an emotional life and you don't want to keep bringing up and digging up old things from your past because they're not reliable, they're not consistent. But when you think of suffering in general, that is consistent. Pain is consistent. It's just the labels that we put on it, our personal experiences are not. I mean, is that question one more time? How does it affect does my the relationship? Does role affect your relationships, does meaning working? Or your personality? Mm -hmm. So the translator, has there been a role? Oh, that's the second question. I think not since, like, college or something. I've been very interested in this. I don't know what the spirit's making, but if you remember Ed Asner, <laughs> he took on this role, and suddenly he Super was all cool. so subconscious and, you know, raspy. And I don't think he was like that before. In other words, there are certain characters, certain actors who take on a role and then it affects their personality, maybe because of the way people react to them or whatever. So I'm not sure what this has to do with the subject at hand, but has that happened to you? Um. I mean, I've had roles that have made me aware of things that I was not aware of before, and perhaps that oh, made that me okay. think differently. If, if it was something that I was, didn't know, I didn't know too much about, you know, pre-Castro Cuba till I did The Cook, and then I learned all about that, you know, things like that. But as far as uh, character changing my personality, I don't think so that I recall, but my friends may disagree. <laughs> I mean... To the similar vein, I mean, I feel like every time you take on a role, you obviously learn something that will influence who I am moving forward after that, after that part is done. Um, I, I mean, I can say they've changed for the better. You know, I also have more compassion and more understanding about a particular culture, history, perspective, about, you know, a situation in, in, in that time period or, or life. In terms of relationships at home or, or in friends, I feel like just in our industry, um, you know, we have, we have to put a lot of work into whatever role that we're playing. And based on what that part is, it can be, well, they're all time consuming. It just depends how much time you need to prepare for that role. And depending on your significant other and talking about with, my, with myself personally, um, I have a very, 
supportive, loving wife. Um, and so, I mean, she understands, you know, you know, of course it can be t tough sometimes, but she understands that, you know, there are certain things that I need to do to prepare for whatever role that I'm preparing for. And so she says that I need that space to do that. Mm -hmm. And if I don't have that space, then obviously I'm not doing a good job and therefore I won't work. Mm -hmm. So I could say, yes, sometimes that can be very challenging. Like, I guess a good example is like, you know, which I'm sure happens to you, and anytime like, hey, we got us a vacation. Sorry, wow. I just booked the job See, and I could no longer do you, that. You know, it's kind of interesting fact. you brought up your wife because Philip Boynkin, the one who was the mad rapist in, in uh, the Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, mm -hmm. uh, what I imagine to be a really draining role, he has to be that vicious person. Now, I talked to him and he said that his wife knows to avoid him for about three weeks after the show's over. And she'll say to him, you know, okay, it's over. <laughs> Get back to being Philip. So has your wife put up with anything like that with you? No, I mean, like, for me, like, f so in this case, like, when the show is over, like, I am very excited and enthused to go home and hang out with my wife. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's my personal experience. Uh, you know. <laughs> Um, so for me, you know, like after the show is over, at least, you know, because I'm still growing and changing, you know, like I said, my younger self actually used to be more, I'm going to go hang out and like meet more actors and like, you know, see what the world is like. And now I'm coming to a place where I'm like, I had a great time at work. I had a great time working with my fellow artists and like, I actually want to go home and hang, and hang out with my wife and see what like her day was like and say, this is what happened today. And so this is where I'm in my process of my life right now. So. That answers that question right now. Okay, th this question actually kind of spins off of something Jessica was saying in a way. What do actors think about roles that feel familiar versus roles that are different from themselves? Is, I guess the question is like, which one's more draining? I need the script. <laughs> I, 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 it doesn't matter if it's close to you or, or, or far from you. You have to go through the same process. Maybe one needs a little more tweaks than others. Nice. Some might be vocally. Some may be the way you carry yourself. Some characters walk differently. Some speak differently. So I think the process is the same, though. Right. I mean, I would say similar to that is that, you know, if I guess the part is similar to, the, similar to me, I would say, okay, so there are certain parts of this character that I can easily access, but there will always be parts within that role that I will need to work on and I have to like stress, and as she say, a dialect or maybe my physical being or maybe a part of my persona that I, you know, don't usually use as much. But the work is still the same, and I think all I can really say is that maybe the one that is more different than me, I guess I'm more excited to play. That's more fun. Yeah, more that's fun. more fun. Because like, okay, like I don't I. I haven't used that muscle of myself maybe since I was in grad school or in high school, or I just never got a chance to try that of myself. So I'm like, okay, great. How do I do this? You know, so therefore that becomes more so, of the... So let me throw a weird thing in here. So say you're, you're playing a part that you see a lot of yourself in it, and part of the role is some character insults you. Do you... Does that hit you harder when you're playing somebody that you see is familiar it than if you're playing a part? It shouldn't, because then then you're not separating the Correct. character from yourself. It exactly. shouldn't hit you. Well, I guess that's the question. You're you're able to separate even when the when you identify uh, with the absolutely. character. Absolutely. Is that something you had to train to do? Um, if you can't separate, then you probably shouldn't be an actor. Yes, that's yeah. <laughs> there's there's pills for that, you know. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, you just have to be able to be very cognizant of what the script is asking of you and knowing, like, okay. I mean, there was a while that I did, that I was starting to take every breakdown that came my way really, really personally, as opposed to taking it as a, as a challenge. Now I say, instead of breakdown, I say the challenge. When it says, well, she's kind of ugly, a little slow, a little fat, and not very pretty, and not very smart, and a loser. I'm like, oh, and so I'm the first person they call. That's great, you know. So I stopped thinking that. that but that's that's when you <laughs> when you've been uh, when you've been doing this for a while, you might hit those points where everything becomes like ah, so hard. You you forget the fun of it. But uh, as far as character reaction and separation, yeah, the only time I had that problem was just before I got Orange Is the New Black. 
Okay, here's a, uh, a rather forward question here. <laughs> a very a person with a strong view and who feels passionate, and I'm going to try to embody that. As a drama student at Tisch, I've been blessed with a support system of teachers and peers who look out for me emotionally and psychologically. Unfortunately, many young actors yet to receive professional training lack the support and are forced to prematurely dig up tender memories before they have fully processed it, putting them in psychological danger. Mm -hmm. How can we protect these students from this trap? Whoa. So the first question I have Whoa. is, are people prematurely digging up tender memories and does that in fact put them in psychological danger? Uh, and then how does it, it's a three-part question. I mean, I think all I can really <laughs> say to that, I mean, you know, our industry is, is so wide open in terms of like going somewhere to learn to educate to be a better actor. And um, it's, I guess it's no different in any, in any other industry or business. Like you can go to a really bad teacher um, and you can just learn bad techniques. And I feel like unfortunately for our, industry because part of it is part about making money you know and if someone is new to the city or doesn't know anything about acting you know and they just pick up a magazine or wherever to say you know i heard this so and so and so is a good teacher and that actually might not be very true mm -hmm. and that person will learn you know everything from the specific teacher and you know down the road that person can find out that that teacher is actually not wasn't educated it wasn't wasn't certified to teach that and so that does all I can really say is that that student who is hungry to learn just needs to be a bit more judicious mm -hmm. about who they choose to learn how to become an actor, or in this case, oh, I can talk about our industry, so to become an actor. And so mm -hmm. that's all I can really say is that, that that student just needs to do a really smart job of researching who's going to be their that's, teacher because, the you know, like I, well, you know, I'm trying to make the transition to do film and television, so I did a lot of homework who I wanted to sit with to learn from. And I sat with some people and I was just like, for me, I was like, I'm not gonna take this class. Mm -hmm. And I watched, you know, people who are new to acting sit there and absorb this as it was, you know, and I understood why, because, you know, I've been there too when I was really young, you know, I went to, so I guess all I can really say is that that individual, whoever that is, just needs to do a really good homework on who the teacher is, where that person studied, um, and get some recommendations and really vet that, really vet that, that, that philosophy because, you know, there can be, you know, here's what I can say, you know, someone can say, oh, I said it was Stella Adler. And that can be like the 10th watered down version of Stella Adler rather than mm -hmm. knowing that that teacher was actually sat in every single Stella Adler class with Stella herself. And okay, so then actually, you know how to teach your class versus someone who was like 11th so string. So you're saying it's not, ne it's not uh, necessarily the school of acting, it's the, it's the teacher. Yeah, absolutely, the it's teacher, the, the teacher. technique, not every technique works for everyone. It's nice to have them all in your toolbox and that's yes. why we go to school, but I don't always need a hammer, you know? Right. <laughs> right. So, so you have to find what works for you best and, and doing your research exactly. You wouldn't just go like walk into any dentist off the street. I mean, maybe if you're in agony, but you, you usually do your research with, with things like, you know, how many people do you check on Yelp before you eat, uh, exactly. uh, you know? And, you know? and some people just say, well, they, they're, they're the best. Well, that's what I heard. They're the best, they're the best, they're the best, but you have to do your research on your own. And, you know, acting is so, is also, you know, there's, there's different versions of acting. You know, do you want to be, um, do you want to study comedy? Do you want to study improvisation? You know, like, not that I'm an improv actor, but I've heard of, uh, Uprights Brigade or, Upright or, 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 or mm -hmm. what's Second City, like, mm -hmm. you know, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll at least say, okay, let me go to those places first. Check you know, it out. To check it out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, depending on what type of medium you want to learn, whether it's comedy, improvisation, film and television, you know, theater, whether it wants to be classically trained or whether it wants to be about new plays, there's always, you know, a specific place that specializes in that world and you can find those people, you know, to... To learn that, you know, going for myself, you know, you know, when I went to go to grad school, I, I vetted, I vetted certain people, <laughs> and I trust those people, and I went to them, 
Um, and I was very fortunate, and I got some really good advice and went to really good places, and it worked out. And so that's all, I can, that's all I can really say to anyone who wants to study anything is that you just really, really need to find out who this teacher is and also just get recommendations and talk to fellow actors who have studied with this individual. I have the last two questions are kind of related, two sides of the coin. Um, so I'll read them at the same time. Do you find you could benefit from a therapy focused on your work as an actor, aside from any personal therapy you take part in? And how does spirituality play a role in the process of religious beliefs? So psychological or you know, therapeutic and religious, can you do can you, should you, do you employ them for your character work? And Did since this saw, theme yeah. is, uh, <laughs> and to get out of the character. Right. Well, what you just saw, I, I use not just my work, but everything. The breath, every moment mm -hmm. is a spiritual practice for me. Mm -hmm. So instead of just taking this gift of being able to do what I do for a living and just doing it for money, I do it as a practice, as a spiritual practice to, de to develop compassion, to develop wisdom, to develop awareness and mindfulness of of the, the, our human condition and the art is the reflection of it, you know, so that that's how that spirituality is worked into what I do every day. Um, I feel bad having cut you off. So <laughs> <you're>, <laughs> no, you, if you could say something in a minute, why, can you share it with us? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, also, I do remember in the past of um, reading that Jessica Lange, after being in the Francis Farmer story, had to take one year, well, chose to take one year on the farm and do nothing because she wouldn't take another role. If anybody ever saw that film where she ends up with a lobotomy and terrible, terrible treatment in a mental institution. It was just horrific. And um, also I had read that out of four actresses who played Agnes in Agnes of God, three of them became very, very seriously sick after playing the role of Agnes. Mm -hmm. So that was all I wanted to say. But I also wanted to say that I think it's the exception rather than the rule. Mm -hmm. I studied uh, drama therapy. And that's something that also requires a lot of closure. After you put people through the paces, mm -hmm. they, you need to be there for them to phone call you or whatever. You mean as the therapist, you have to yeah, do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we're, uh, we're come to an end here. Any other questions, Melissa? Or... No, we're, we're all done. <laughs> 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 Okay, that's the time. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, panelists.